Hello and good afternoon. I'm Melody Brown Thomas, Associate Director of Sales for the Atlantic. I'd like to welcome you all to Thomson Reuters Knowledge Exchange entitled Trust as the Currency of the New Economy. I'd also like to introduce the moderator, Scott McCluskey, who is Global Head of Regulatory Intelligence for Thomson Reuters. Scott? Thank you, Melody. And thank you, everybody, for, for coming out today. And, and thanks to the hosts uh, for this fabulous lunch at this fabulous location. Personally, I'm going to hate going home and, and eating my own cooking after a week out here, but uh, I'm going to milk this for all it's worth. Um, so, that, you know, as is always the case with the Aspen Ideas Festival, there's, there's a lot of really good things going on here. Um, and this particular lunch, I think, is, is, is very topical, and it was one that I was very happy to be asked to moderate. This whole idea of trust, uh, and trust in particular as it applies to what we're broadly calling the new economy. Now, trust has always arguably been out there in every business, in every age. But, uh, you know, if you take a look at what's been going on over the past five or ten years, I think that it's becoming more and more of an issue, uh, and not just some sort of warm and fuzzy thing, but something with real concrete effects. And, you know, I, I think that as we get into the future and what we're pleased to call the new economy, it, it's going to become more and more important. And so uh, we've invited a very distinguished panel here to talk about the various aspects of all this. And, uh, you know, trust itself is, is a, you know, it's a very broad term, and we're going to, to draw upon their experience uh, to tease out some of the various aspects of this. So I'll just briefly introduce them, and, and we'll start on the outside and work our way in if that's okay. So on the far end is, is William Mayer. William is uh, the founder and partner of Park Avenue Equity Partners. He spent 23 years at First Boston and has been a professor and dean at two business schools, uh, University of Maryland, University of Rochester. Uh, and this is not his first time at the Aspen Institute. Uh, Chairman Emeritus of the Aspen Institute and, and largely responsible for a lot of what it is today. So thank you for coming, Bill. Uh, next to him is uh, James Coulter, uh, who is founding partner of TBG Capital, which is one of the world's largest uh, private equity firms. Uh, he's also got a, a I, I won't call it your, your side job, but something that you're doing that's very important, you were just speaking about, uh, which is your, uh, is it co-chair or chair? Co-chair of an uh, initiative called Leading Education by Advancing Digital. And, and I would imagine some of that will come out in our uh, discussion here. Uh, so. Uh, next to Jim is Peter Orsag, uh, a name familiar to, uh, I think, uh, almost everybody here, Vice Chairman in, uh, of Corporate and Investment Banking at Citigroup, uh, and also Chairman of its Financial Strategy and Solutions Group, uh, former head of both the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget, and a Senior Advisor for the Council of Economic Advisors. And finally, uh, Jillian Tepp, one of my favorite columnists, Assistant Editor and Columnist at the FT, uh, where she covers a range of issues, including economic, financial, uh, political and social. She's also an author. Uh, you wrote one book about the Japanese crisis, one about the recent crisis, and I think you've got another one in the works. 
Should we be worried? Do you know something we don't know? <laughs> We'd have to wait and see. Okay. <laughs> so buy the book. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and start off, if I could just ask each of you just to spend a couple of minutes with, uh, with a few general thoughts on what this topic means to you and, and some of what you've seen. So uh, why don't we start this way and work our way out now. So. Well, Scott asked me to kick off um, with pointing out a couple of key themes on the issue of trust. As Scott says, I am actually writing a book at the moment, and I've been doing a lot of research into surveys on trust, also for my FD columns. And I wasn't allowed to bring along my geeky charts and data because I was told that would give you indigestion over your lunch. <laughs> but there are two key themes that come out of the survey data since 2007. Firstly, since 2007, what you can see very clearly in the surveys is that there has been a rolling erosion of trust in most of the institutions around us. If you go back to 2007, you see trust in banks decline very sharply followed by trust in businesses generally, followed by trust in media as well, that was actually simultaneous, then trust in government. So there's always, almost been like a series of dominoes toppling. The good news, if you like, is that it hasn't just gone down in a straight line, you've seen some rebounds, but the bad news is that we are living in a world where trust in most of the institutions around us has been questioned very severely. But there's one exception which is fascinating, because if you look at something like the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is a very good way of tracking sentiment, the one sector where trust has not declined, at least in the latest survey data taken in January, or published in January, is technology. Technology companies, surprisingly, at least until January, were one area where trust was still high, and it's very interesting to ask, can that actually be maintained in the current climate or not? Is that the next institution that's going to be toppled? The other quick point is that if you look at the survey data, there's been a very important shift from what I call vertical patterns of trust to horizontal patterns of trust. What do I mean by that? Well, if you dial back two or three decades and ask people, who do you actually look to for advice and leadership? Who do you believe in? Essentially, people were saying individuals like CEOs, politicians, civic leaders. Those were the people that people looked up to, vertically if you like, and trusted for guidance. When Edelman, could go back to that survey again, asked that question late last year, the respondents said only 36% of them today look to government officials for guidance. Sorry, Peter. I'm not a government official anymore. Okay, well, 43% of them look to CEOs. 50% of them, however, look to so-called regular employees in companies for information about what's happening. 61% look to a group called a person like you, your peer group. And if you combine that with the shift, or rather the continued faith in technology, what it's essentially saying is that people today trust their Facebook friends for good advice, more than CEOs, more than the leaders that you know, people have traditionally looked at, more than, frankly, many of you in your previous roles. Good implications in some ways. We're moving perhaps to a more egalitarian, democratic age. Bad implications in terms of the potential for... <laughs> it's, it's egalitarian that way. You, you see everyone's flaws. The point is, you, you knew your friend's flaws, you didn't know the president's flaws, and now you know everyone's flaws. So in business, uh, we're constantly faced with the problem that trust is absolutely essential to what we do, yet, the, yet we face the question of are we trusting too much? So the very moment that we stopped handing gold back and forth and started to believe this piece of paper somehow had value, we had an entire system therefore built on trust. We have um, about 100 companies around the world, from Russia to China to Indonesia, so we have to deal with this issue of trust across different legal systems, across different ethical systems. And uh, the key question for us is not um, should we trust, it's absolutely essential to what we do, but who do we trust? And that's the piece that's been most difficult as uh, the world has become ever more complicated, is the pillars of trust that we came to be comfortable with are somehow no longer there. I remember the first time I was involved in something that was in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times. 
I had this epiphany because for years I had read these these uh, and the Financial Times, of course. Uh, <laughs> I read these. Yeah, uh, the these FT was taken for granted. Uh, just for granted. It was. Uh, I had taken for granted that I was getting the truth, and I trusted these. And then I was involved in something that was being written about, and I realized what was actually happening versus what was being written was much different. And so I began to have this question of if you can't trust the Financial Times, who t can you trust? And now... You, you can trust Reuters. Absolutely. <laughs> and now I get information twitted you know, on an on a, on a, uh, hourly basis. What do I trust that's coming across my device? And that, that question of who to trust is, has been very difficult. But can I ask a more basic question, which is who would you trust today to know which hotel to pick to go on vacation? Because in the past, you'd go to your travel guide, you'd look up to the trusted expert. Today, we all go online and look at peer group comments. Right. Is that a bad thing? I happen to think that actually peer group comments are probably a better way to get information about something than the travel, travel expert, you know, or the head of a travel company. Uh, with one exception, which is I think the peer group comments, uh, uh, yeah, bias towards negative, I mean, they are very effective at identifying problems, but they also skew towards uh, negativity. There are very few people, at least in my experience, that spend a lot of time online saying, I just had, you know, or reading a column and saying, this was the best thing I've ever read, read ever. The, the, it, it skews negative, and it, that's just, uh, you know, you have to bias, you have to take that into account. And I don't think psychologically we do that yet. I mean, we have not adapted to this new world of kind of universal uh, input, in part because we have been conditioned to take things we read or see on the screen as being true. And at this point, the probability that what you read or see is true is probably under 50 percent, so to your point of who you trust, but also because I think there is a bias in, the, in that media towards negativity, basically. But if any of you do want to go online and say you like Peter or my column, please go ahead. Well, let's, let's bring you in on this, and, and you know, what, what are your views on all this? You're obviously very deeply involved in business as well. Uh, I relate to what uh, Jamie said uh, earlier. My epiphany about uh, news and what you read is not necessarily what happened. It was way back in the 60s in Vietnam, flying in the Air Force and on a mission and happened to get involved in an incident that uh, we certainly didn't want to be involved in that were, and then came back. And it took us a while back then. There was no Twitter. There was no nothing. And everybody said, oh, my God, are you okay? I mean, all of the reports. And I'm going, well, yeah, we're fine. And as I read the reports, it was a total distortion and misrepresentation of actually what happened. And it was like the, uh, the aha moment <coughs> that from then on. But what's happened, I think, overall, we all know that in the past, uh, you know, not a new thought, news was filtered. We had three major stations on TV. We had really very dominant newspapers. And so in some sense, the Associated Press was very powerful. And so things were sort of, I'm going to use the word on purpose, filtered down. And so we didn't have the choice of what we have today. And I have a brother who's as different from me as night is today, and he spends his whole day listening to things that reinforce his belief system, yep. you know, as opposed to opening up and uh, listening to other things. So when you come back to this issue of, of trust, in, 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 and that's, there's a lot of words in the, the, the language that are in and around that, you know, honest, credibility, reliability, confidence, some stuff we talked on the phone the other day. And for the me, <clears throat> the one that jumps off the page is confidence, which is really related to trust. And I happen to think the lack of that in just about anything accounts for part of the very, very slow economic recovery. Yeah. People went in their foxhole in 2008 <clears throat> and didn't know the rules of the road coming back out of it and were just very reluctant to go and make any kind of really major investment or capital spending decisions. Sure. And, and you know, I first started looking at the various dimensions uh, when Thomson Reuters was building its trust index, and, and they brought me in to kind of you know, talk about how do we measure this. And to your point, uh, it's not just trust in terms of the integrity of the banker who's taking your deposit. It's also confidence uh, in the financial system, confidence in the world economy. And, and as we measure things like how is, is trust viewed in the financial uh, world in Europe, we see that it's largely driven by a, 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 an underlying lack of confidence in the, uh, in the Euro system. You, you had a point to make. No, I was going to say, um, how many of you have studied Latin in your life? Wow. Wow. What an amazing Renaissance crowd. <laughs> Should we just um, switch to Latin? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Well, in that case, you may know um, that, you know, th th the reason why credit markets are called credit is because credit comes from the Latin word credere, which I once wrote in a column means to trust, at which point every single Latin teacher in the Western Hemisphere <laughs> wrote me angry emails saying, no, it doesn't. Turns out there are many Latin teachers that read the FT, which is great. Um, in fact, credere means to believe. And the key point is this, that, you know, finance without faith is worth absolutely naught, no matter how good your flashy computer models, and credit markets without credit in the Latin sense of belief just don't work. Mm. And I guess one question is, how do we restore belief in the financial system and in banks today? Well, the good news is it's based on LIBOR, and we can all trust that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, while we're talking about the financial system, you know, this, this whole issue is about more than just the financial crisis. But, you know, it, we we you know not be doing our jobs if we didn't address that. And there's one particular aspect that grows out of that that, that I'd like to throw out to you, uh, and that's the proper role of government in establishing, reinforcing, and and restoring trust. Um, and, and I guess the open question, um, you know, to to throw the the cat among the pigeons is. Did we trust too much and deregulate too much before the crisis? Um, or was that totally irrelevant to, to how it happened? Okay, well, I uh, think the answer has to be yes, based on uh, looking back. And of course, it's always easier to look back than uh, when you're in the moment. But I, I think, as I look at it, part of it is this country and part of it is around the world. And I always think of uh, the United States versus, versus Britain where, you know, here it's laws based. Everything this is a law for everything. And what it does, it creates a situation where some people I knew would say completely amorally, well, it's either legal or it isn't. And in, and in Britain, it's different. You know, it's rules based. And there's a, there's a, a, a room for a regular to a regulator to interpret it, pr what that in the applicability. Based. Yeah, principles I'm based. sorry, principles based. And I frankly think that's a better system than what we have because to go back to the, uh, you know, the, the red light and the, the speed sign, <clears throat> if you're, if you're going to cheat a little, and I don't know whether that's what we do, but let's assume we do. So you have really the worst of two worlds. And in a sense, what the West needs to decide today when it comes to finance is which of the two does it want? Because I don't think most of us want to live in a world like the Chinese, where the Fed calls up all of you lot who are running financial institutions every two weeks and says, do this, do that. But that's been the drift of regulation. But at the same time, have we actually created enough transparency to have effective mutual surveillance and peer group pressure? And, and if I could just put a twist on that as well, because you're all involved in the capital markets now. Uh, I mean, this idea of transparency in particular, as we look into the future of, of the markets, markets, even when you compare them to the time of the financial crisis, they're much more complex. They move much, much faster, particularly, but not exclusively, the equity markets. And so if, if the markets are different, can we rely on, on the market to regulate itself? Uh, well, no, but... Um, <laughs> okay, thank but, you. Next question. <laughs> but, That's but, reassuring. But, but, I, but I think one thing that, that is different and what, that has been changing is um, the sus trust in a highly networked situation is different than trust in a... Uh, situation where one domino tipping over doesn't knock the whole uh, pile down or the whole line down, and one of the one of the key characteristics of the financial system, you know, in 2005, six, seven, was the degree to which uh, capital ratios were low and leverage ratios were very high. And when you do that, when you ha when you run a very highly leveraged financial uh, sector as a whole, the degree to which a problem at one place can then uh, explode into problems throughout the whole system is significantly accentuated. So in addition to uh, the factors that Gillian was uh, highlighting, I think one of the key problems was just capital was inadequate. And when capital is inadequate, the probability of any given institution blowing up when it's running on a razor thin uh, capital structure, and then crucially, if everyone else is running on a razor thin capital structure, that problem propagating itself that's a core problem. Okay. To, just to maybe move this over, just 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 a notch in terms of uh, uh, of the trust, and part of that is having the perception that you have a level playing field. 
<clears throat> and that if you're going to be, whether it's in the market or you're going to be in real estate, you're going to be having a company, owning a company, uh, that uh, uh, there's a sense that you're not going to be taken advantage of and you have as much ability and, and, and chance as anybody else. And I think what happened is that uh, the feeling was that, no, that's not the case. And certainly as it relates to the financial system. And going back to where we are now, I, I think that in terms of the economy, that it's maybe just six months ago that people have started coming out of their foxhole and feeling a little more confident. Um, uh, for the longest time, it was, well, what, it, what are the rules going to be from a tax standpoint if you're talking about making a capital investment? And the companies I'm, I'm involved in, you know, you had to drag us screaming to make a capital commitment because uh, the rules were so unsure about uh, how you would calculate a return and also the, uh, the unwillingness to make a commitment because of the uncertainty of the economic future. And so this issue, and I don't know how you get to the level playing field and the confidence because this c could get into a question of uh, how much influence does government actually have on business anyhow. No, I was just going to say, well, another way of looking at what's happened in the last six months is that the world has become cynically um, used to the fact that they can't trust anymore. And there's simply been an adjustment and adaptation process going on that people recognize that actually institutions and governments can't be trusted, but never mind, we'll get on with it because we know what we can trust around us. So you're an anthropologist here. I mean, it, it, it is true, right? We all human beings are really rather unusual animals, how adaptable we are. And yeah. so you're saying maybe we the adapt. Post, maybe the post-war era when everyone looked up to government or to business and trusted them, maybe that was just a phase in history which is now over. Uh, so I think uh, just a more complicated world, which means we're going to have a more complicated series of crises of trust. So my entire business career has been crises of trust. So let me just hit a couple of really fun ones along the way because we, I think sometimes we all, um, we all focus on the last crisis whatever it was. So we bought a Chinese company. Turns out under Chinese law, Shanghai Z law, that the rights of the company exist within a single piece of wood called the chop. This, this is true, that basically from old times you had your stamp and if you had the, you basically, no, there are no bylaws, et cetera, the chop is everything. So we bought the company and had $100 million in its bank account. Management wasn't happy with the fact that they were going to be fired, so they ran off with the chop. Uh, and they, they hid out for, the for, for two weeks. Now, in Chinese society, had they used the chop, they would be executed, right? Because they didn't have the right to use the chop, but we didn't have the right either because we didn't physically have it. So for three weeks, $100 million was held up in a bank account until the Shanghai government agreed to give us a new piece of wood. So, uh, you know, th this, uh, and so the question is, how can you ever invest in China again, having been through that? And the answer is that you're always going to have these crises of trust, and we always have to make sure not to overreact to them. Another answer would be hire an anthropologist to explain to you the local practices. Uh, absolutely. But the practice, the other, another recent one was fun was uh, we bought a uh, hypermarket company in China, or in uh, Russia. Uh, so we have uh, food stores across Russia, and uh, we had, uh, some distant shareholders who didn't like us much because they couldn't take kickbacks anymore. And as a result, uh, they attacked us in the paper. It turns out in the Moscow press, if you pay reporters, they'll actually write what you want. So I woke up one morning with a translated article uh, declaring I was a CIA agent, and we had bought these hypermarkets in order to put poisoned food into the Russian system in case of war. Uh, and so the question is, well, you can't trust the Moscow Post, you can't trust uh, this, uh, et cetera. No, that was fixed. We then paid someone to write the other article that says we weren't CIA agents. But <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the issue is these issues of trust are becoming much more complicated. And therefore, in this international world, I think part of what we're feeling to bring this back together is we're running into crises of trust so much more often because the world is so much more complicated that we're a little shaken. And, and that, that, that's affecting us uh, deeply. Let's turn this question of rule of law, uh, let's turn the telescope around and instead of looking at it internationally, we were talking uh, on the phone earlier, there's a domestic aspect of yeah. this too, isn't there? The, the three most feared words in international business are a Texas jury. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we often talk about the U.S. law system as something that's, that's, that's kind of sacrosanct and aren't you comfortable investing here? 
But uh, like most businesses, we settle an awful lot of cases that we know we should win because the lottery system of our jury trial system is you know, immensely scary. Uh, I sat on the board of a Chinese company that had a large investment in the US, Lenovo Computers, and they were scared to death of the US legal system. And probably rightly so. Okay, well, we, we've talked a lot about the financial system. Um, what about other industries? Are there industries where, where you foresee crises of trust? You're, you're predicting technology simply because it hasn't had one yet. Um, well, I think, I, I, I mean, I was predicting that back in January when I wrote a column about it. I think since then we've seen plenty of reasons why technology may indeed be and the next domino to topple over. I mean, I don't need to run through it, but, you know, NSA, PRISM, et cetera, et cetera. Or the simple fact that we're seeing a lot of cyber hacking and the fact that we've all learned that our Blackberries or iPhones don't always work. You know, that's a shock to the system. But, um, yeah. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. Did, how many of you were at the music tent yesterday for the Peter Costello Twitter uh, discussion? So there was this moment where Katie Couric, Couric was trying to get h him to say whether or not they were releasing data. And that was a moment about trust, right? Because Peter, all of us use this, this uh, our Twitter accounts, and how much can we trust whether that's private? And Katie was looking for him to say, no, you can't trust us to protect our data. And, and he was unwilling to do that. And that was a fascinating moment of a new industry dealing with this question of trust. But if you want to go back to first basics, the thing that links finance and technology is that we as consumers are essentially putting our faith in a group of uber techno geeks who basically have control of information that 99.9% .9 of the population do not understand. I mean, maybe because we're in Aspen, this won't quite work. But how many of you have the foggiest idea of how your iPhone actually works or how the Internet works? You know, I mean, if it all went black, could you build it from scratch, you know, <laughs> with a few twigs and everything else? I mean, we all trust enormously that it's just kind of there and it's going to work. We all trusted pre-2007 that the Uber geeks who were doing the CDOs and stuff, you know, knew what they were doing. Same thing in medicine. We all trust when we take pills that essentially the uber geeks who have put those medicines together, you know, know what they're doing. Well, you know, th there's always, uh, in every company, there, there's the bit of the code of conduct that says, by the way, we can read your emails. And yet, still, you know, you, you always look at the, the disciplinary write-ups where there's somebody was doing something they shouldn't, accessing a, an internet site or whatever. And I don't think that it's so much a matter of, of, of their trusting the company. It's, it's just... They, they can't be bothered with worrying about it. it. It's to me the analogy, and forgive me for using this analogy during lunch, but it's the guy picking his nose at the, at the stoplight. You know, he's surrounded by glass and, and, and acts like there's nobody watching him. And I think you see a lot of that uh, in the emails as well, and, and this, this whole thing about social media. I'm, I'm always uh, amazed. I, maybe it's just me. I presume that somebody's going to have access to my data. I mean, we got a security guy and he's doing this, and I can't do that, and I got a passcode, whatever. But I have another friend that, uh, you know, is deeply involved in the cybersecurity okay. issue and uh, deals, works with governments and large companies. And he's basically telling me, no, no, sooner or later, if they want to get in, they're going to get in. And it's about response and segregating and segmenting your data in different areas. So I, I'm, I'm always amazed that people don't either don't realize or think that uh, they should presume that everything they have is somebody's liable to see it. Did, did I say that wrong? No, I think you're right. A every single piece of your digital life, whether it's transactions, emails, what have you, I think your operational assumption, unfortunately, should be that ultimately you have zero privacy in it because ultimately it, it will either be hacked or if it's on the corporate system, I mean, it's amazing not only you know, people are still conducting emails with personal attorneys through corporate email systems. I mean, there are all sorts of things that are happening that just don't make any sense. And it's because we still believe that, uh, you know, there is a degree of privacy in that that I think you, you shouldn't assume. Maybe, can I just take a little bit of a contrarian uh, view there? And that is that, uh, in one sense, it's, it's good that it's part of big data because it's one thing that the NSA can see my emails, but my emails are at the bottom of a of a very large pile of other people's emails. And it's one thing to have your your data in a database. It's another thing for it to be transparent to somebody. Um, and, and so are we worried too much about this? Yeah, but if they ever wanted to go back, let's say something, Lord forbid, happens with you, and they ever wanted to go back and see everything that you have written or done, they can retrieve that. The point is you don't need real-time monitoring in order to lose your privacy. Sure. There can be ex post loss. 
Okay, you've convinced me. I'm worried. <laughs> you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's a constant challenge. Whenever there's a new technological um, revolution, regulation and policing has a hard time keeping up. And so to use my earlier analogy of the roads with the guardrails and the policemen, there is, you know, we are going 100 miles an hour on this data thing, and we're not sure where the guardrails are, and we don't even know who the policemen are at the moment. And our regulation law and systems aren't set up for it. We use emails as conversation, yet they're all discoverable in ways that conversation aren't, uh, isn't. Uh, and that, uh, I'm really troubled by that. Big question to other industries. Uh, my biggest problem is I, don't, I, I really miss Walter Cronkite. You know, I, I don't know who to trust for the information. Our business is only as good as the analytics and information we get. And uh, we seem to have lost uh, the, the checks and balances about the quality of that information. And that, to me, is one of our biggest risks. Wikipedia is not Encyclopedia Britannica, even though we use it as that. So here, I think, is the hardest question, which is, uh, I, I also yearn for, you know, Walter Cronkite. But will we still, will we still trust Walter Cronkite today? And I'm not sure the answer to that is yes. Because, again, if you go back to all the leaders that we had such trusted, whether it's, you know, Lincoln, what have you, if you actually knew uh, then what we would be able to know now, I don't think the level of trust would be there. I, it comes back to the point I was trying to make earlier, which I, don't, I wish was not, were not the case. But I think, unfortunately, trust may have a, just a teeny bit of opacity that is necessary for it, just a teeny bit. And, we're, and we don't have any anymore. Or if you like, you know, faith needs to be a little bit blind to work. Yeah, good point. Well, I want to make sure that we have time for questions from the audience. We've got a floating microphone, and uh, I'll ask everybody to wait until the microphone is there because this is being recorded uh, by American Public Media. If any of you want to see this later, um, it'll be available on the Minnesota Public Radio site. Why don't we start with this lady right here? One of the points you made was about trust in the media, and so I'd like to tie that in with what you were saying earlier about um, the economy's uh, plunge. But Frontline did a great job on exposing how it really started, and the annihilation of a woman named Brooksley Bourne, and how many people that are in the know really know who Brooksley Bourne was, and what people like Larry Summers and Robert Rubin and Alan Greenspan did to absolutely undercut her and make her uh, basically have to leave office. And so when you repeat a lie over and over and over again and say that it was just the last eight years and you don't go back to where it really started, the only one who admitted that he wasn't his finest day was Arthur Levitt. He had the guts to come on the camera and say, I'm really sorry that I did that. So what I'm saying about trust is when you see that CBS, NBC, and ABC put on these little snippets, and they pick what snippet they're going to put on, then you never get the truth. So I just wanted to see if, you, if anybody else was sorry about Brooksley Bourne and what happened to her. And she was a whistleblower. By the, by the way, I think Bill Clinton has also said that he felt that was a mistake for what it was worth. If I could just give some background on that, Brooks Bourne was, was the head of the CFTC, and she was pushing to get credit derivatives regulated. And uh, at the time, the CFTC was probably, you know, let's say it, it was the junior partner in the regulatory world. And going up against the SEC and the Fed, uh, the, the frontline story was basically that, that she was overruled and, and you know, uh, kept out of the way. And of course, as things turned out uh, a few years later, credit default uh, swaps and other credit derivatives were at the heart of the crisis. So uh, I would say, and I'll, I'll, I'll get your opinion on this too as a journalist, you know, it, it is somewhat inevitable though that you have to pick and, and, and choose, you know, what is said and what is not. Now certainly that does not justify, uh, and I'm not saying that this was the case, uh, an editor deliberately forming the news. Now there have been cases in the past, uh, uh, you know, certainly uh, you know, scandals where that has happened and it's cost them some major newscasters their careers. But I mean, is, is that something that you've got to deal with, uh, you know, you're, you're in your editorial role at the FT and in your career? Um, when I was an anthropologist, I was very influenced by the works of a man called Pierre Bourdieu, who argued that the way that elites stay in power is not just by controlling the means of production, i.e. the money, but shaping how we think. And what really matters in that respect is 
not so much what's talked about, but what's not talked about. It's these social silences, the sort of blank bits on the edge of our cognitive map that really matters. And if you look back at finance um, over the last two decades, or the financial system, the reality is that things like credit derivatives and much of the debt markets were essentially social silences. You know, we talked obsessively about equity markets. We kind of ignored that dark underbelly. And as we've learned in history, it's almost always the geeky social silences that we ignore because they're unfashionable or too geeky or taboo or just look too darn boring to worry about. Those are the things that almost always matter and end up tripping us up. Okay, let's move on to another question. Uh, let's take somebody back there. Yeah. So just to follow up on that for a moment, I wonder if any of you could comment on where is the underbelly now? What should we be looking at that is <laughs> we, we, we're not worrying about, but should be keeping us up at night? I'm going to go ahead and, and give the first answer to that because it's something that, that I actually think about quite a bit. Um, I think what keeps regulators up at night and probably should keep us up at night as well is the system is much faster and much more fragile. And so regulation, you know, I think that there are certain jobs that everybody would agree that it does, and one of them is consumer protection, one of them is, you know, ensuring stability of the financial system. And I think the the reality now, as I said earlier, is that markets are much more complex, much faster. And if it's five o'clock on a Friday and somebody comes in and says we found another Bernie Madoff, then you then you can say we're going to get on this first thing Monday. If, on the other hand, they walk in and it's five minutes before closing bell and they say the market's down 1,300 points and we don't know why you're going to have a late night. And, and, and so there's very little reaction time. And, and so the speed of the market uh, correspondingly reduces reaction time. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's important that, that the tools be available. Uh, that, I think, is the market stability, I think, is a big issue. But you're not here to hear me talk, so. Yeah, a couple of things that keep me up at night. Uh, are we in a yield bubble? We've had free money for a long time. And if you look over history, this hasn't happened. And I don't think we understand the implications of it and uh, can't go on forever. And what does that mean? Uh, it feels a little bit to me like a fraternity party at 1 AM where uh, you know you should probably go home on some of this stuff. But on the other hand, the party's still going on for a while. And uh, the longer you stay, the worse you're going to feel tomorrow. But we've been at this party's been going on a while, and I worry about it. The second is a point we touched on earlier. The uh, uber geeks of data and technology are we're increasingly um, dependent on them in ways we don't understand. And the cyber crime side of wor the world and the, uh, the safety of data and our technological systems. You know, who says the internet can't go down, right? We're wiring billions of dollars around, you know, who's protecting that in a world where uh, the, the, the speed of it all is outstripping our ability to uh, regulate it? How, how does that work? I know that's actually what happened in Estonia, what was it, three and a half years ago, where the, through cyber hacking, it actually shut down the financial system for about three days. Yeah. So I, 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 it, it's, it's hard, but okay, so parties recur, right? So we had a party in the beginning of the 2000s and so then ball blew up. You may want to start it in 2007, certainly no later than September 15th, 2008 with Lehman. And uh, so now maybe we have another party, and, and, but this is a cycle that keeps going on and I suppose it's, it's partially a question of, you know, how drunk are you? And, uh, you know, certainly as we got to 2000, when you're, when you're drunk, it's hard to know. <laughs> it's hard to know. But so you need, so who's going to tell you you're drunk, right? right? Who's, who's going to make, who's going to make the decision to say stop? I was going to say the reason why social silences matter so much is because that's where the information asymmetries are greatest, where you essentially have a small group of people who know what's happening and most people don't. And where essentially blind faith is also greatest. Um, and, you know, something I do a lot as a journalist is sit there and think, well, what are we not writing about? So here's just one thing that I will put on the table in terms of a social silence. How many of you recently have thought about antibiotics? Okay, well, that's actually quite encouraging because, I mean, maybe you've thought about them because you've taken them. Um, but if you think about what's happening today with antibiotics, it's barely discussed in public. But the reality is that today in the world, antibiotics are being used so widely, often the wrong thing, there is a real risk in the next few years that they're going to become less and less effective. 
and a world without effective antibiotics is frankly a terrifying world. And yet partly because it's an area of, and I'm picking deliberately an area of medicine which is actually easier to understand than most areas of modern medicine, because it is a geeky area of medicine that most of us are not trained to understand, and because it hasn't created a crisis yet, it's kind of in that area of social silence. So that's one tiny suggestion. Okay, let's move on to another question. Let's go out to the wings here. Uh, the gentleman way over there. So uh, I, I'd like to invite Jillian and maybe some of the other panelists to put on their anthropological hats and uh, see if there's perhaps a disconnect between the way the Earthlings answer these surveys and the way the Earthlings actually behave. Uh, on this subject of trust. Uh, it seems to me that the Earthlings are behaving in a very trustful manner when they don't trust governments to maintain the purchasing power of, uh, of paper money. They buy gold. Well, they're doing exactly the opposite. Uh, they're lending money to governments at one and a half or two percent. Uh, they're pushing stocks up to uh, five or six year uh, record highs. I just don't see the behavior uh, in markets uh, being at all consistent with this lack of trust that's uh, uh, been the subject of today's discussion, and I invite some comment on that. Let's we'll start with the geeky economist. Uh, Peter the anthropologist. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I think that's right. If you look at behavior, people are, uh, uh, n you know, numerous times every minute, every second, uh, engaging in things that, in, uh, you know, indicate a certain level, actually a high level of trust. But I come back to the question that was raised earlier, which is, uh, why are they doing that? Is it just because it's so convenient? So, for example, you know, we all have electronic devices. I hope we all know that basically uh, there, you have effectively zero privacy in uh, what you're doing on that device, but it is so convenient that you do it anyway. And similarly, walking around with a bunch of gold in order to buy your Diet Coke across the street isn't particularly convenient. So. Uh, uh, Paper money, uh, you know, was invented for convenience, and it still is quite convenient. As are, and even more so, with regard to, you know, just holding my phone up at the Starbucks and paying that way. That's even more convenient than cash. And so I'm trusting in all of the back uh, office uh, data geeks that that transaction will flow through. There's sort of, in in some sense, even more trust embodied in that my holding up my phone to pay for my Starbucks tea than in handing over a dollar of of cash. But I'm doing it because that way I don't have to walk around with dollar bills. It's even, it's even more convenient. So I think there's a trade-off between modern convenience and trust, and it's not necessarily inconsistent to say people's trust levels have gone down, but we're just kind of ignoring it because the convenience factor has gone up even more. Okay, I'm going to try to fit in one more question. So uh, this gentleman right here. A number of the panelists have referred to uh, guardrails in terms of managing trust and confidence, uh, whether it be in the United States and China. Um, what happened to the guardrails that were managed in 2007, 8, and early 2009 in the United States? So going back to this question, did we trust too much? I think uh, to the cyclicality of trust, so the guardrails had been essentially moved out, so to the point of leverage ratios for banks, et cetera we had allowed over time, as we cyclically do, things to get looser and looser and looser. They got too loose. All right, I'm a free markets person, but they got too loose. I believe rails and a few cops along the way on the road. I don't believe in cops every 10 feet, and I don't believe in, in narrow guard rails. But they got too wide. And what we're in the process of doing now is bringing them in. I don't know if Dodd-Frank is the right place to set them, but it's a process of bringing them in. I think lots of people were responsible. But isn't it back to that wonderful quote from Upton Sinclair that it's very hard to make a man understand if his job depends on not understanding? And pre-2007, 2008, there were an awful lot of people who had every reason to effectively turn a blind eye and not ask the right questions and not look at the social silences. Peter? Well, I, I guess from my perspective, I think the regulatory failure was not necessarily that because uh, I, don't, I don't think any of the people who are kind of running regulatory policy were, uh, you know, were looking at direct, their own direct financial interests as opposed to just uh, coming back to the blind faith. It's to, to do the, the speeding analogy, it was, I mean, the claims that were being made, which turned out to be false, were we have highly sophisticated players here, so don't worry. And that actually was 
uh, wrongly, but it was also the claim in the derivatives debate with Brooksley Bourne. These are really sophisticated players. So it's almost like you know a bunch of Formula One drivers saying, don't worry, we're speeding, but we got this. So you can let the guardrails out a little bit. And the problem is, and I think it's just inherent in the technology question that we were talking about, the healthcare question, a lot of questions, people coming across as very sophisticated and saying, we got this. And yet, if they don't have it, it's catastrophic for all of us. That therein lies, I think, a central challenge, which is how do you evaluate the claims that the Formula One driver says, I've, I've practiced a lot and I got this, versus if that guy crashes, it hurts all of us. You, 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 I think what tends to happen, certainly, is you get a little bit of crowd think, and it's a little hard to lean against the crowd, and that's part of what you were talking about before derivatives, but that was much more widely <coughs> might widely spread. And the other thing, and if Tom was asking a question, he should be up here in the panel. But uh, 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 part of what was going on and does go on is the creation of products. And you had a lot of uh, mortgage-related products that were created that, frankly, in hindsight, make no sense at all. And um, uh, that's the job of a lot of people on Wall Street, because you create a product, you have to try to create a spread in that when you divide up a mortgage, principal, interest, whatever. And uh, uh, what happened, of course, when things blew up, you know, what happened is you just swallowed what I call the original reason for the financial markets, and that's facilitate, facilitate the flow of capital from the need, the people who need it, for, you know, from the people who have it for economic growth and economic benefit. And so one of the problems we've had in Wall Street and in the country and in the world, you've had partly because of technology, really starting in 79 when the mortgage stuff really started to grow, is you had the ability to create money by financial transactions for its own sake as opposed for economic growth of the country. I don't know how you stop that, and that's part of the debate of transparency and trying to get derivatives listed and trying to separate out some of the proprietary trading from, from banks. Well, I think that, you know, that's a very good uh, point for us to finish up on. I'm afraid we're, we're out of uh, our allotted time here. I'd like to, to thank very much the panel here and maybe a round of applause for all of them. And thank you. Uh, also to each of the, you in the audience here for being here, I think uh, first time I've ever been in such a Latin speaking uh, uh, audience before, but you don't know how to use your phone, so I don't feel quite so bad. So thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your lunch. Thank you. <laughs>